too. It's still morning, I suppose, so good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom, Ujambo. And a wagwan, little Jamaican thing in there. I begin with a statement on truth. You notice I put my shoes over there, and I take my shoes off when I speak because speaking is a sacred act. There are many ways in which we speak. Sometimes we speak nonsense. But in contexts like these, you come here with the expectation that I speak as truthfully as possible. And as a consequence, it means that we're establishing a sacred space. Now, why the shoes off then? Well, the shoes are off because it's to take, it's an act of honor to ancestors. And ancestors, as we know, are witnesses. And witnesses assess the evidentiality of what we say. But of course, to be ancestors, there have, there have to be descendants. And as a consequence, that means that when the ancestors spoke, there were people who were not yet there. And as we today speak, it means if we take on the task of becoming ancestors, it means there are those who are not yet here. And that means there are those to come. But of course, the ancestors are also no longer here. And so that relationship becomes a complicated one. Because it means, in many ways, if we speak truth, and truth is connected to ancestors and descendants, then ultimately, we're part of a situation that's always both present and absent. Now, of course, what makes this very tricky is that there are some people who don't care about ancestors and some people who don't care about descendants. And those are the people who govern our planet at the moment. <laughs> and those are people, as we know, for whom the mentality is that when they go, it is not about who's to come. And that is because in their arrogance, they see their departure as the end of the world. And this is one of the reasons why, as we speak about climate change and we speak about the disaster they are wreaking on our planet and on life, it fall, those, that speaking falls upon deaf ears. Because ultimately, what matters to them is themselves. Now, truth is a very complicated matter. Because, you know, many people talk about truth, but they never really reflect upon what it is. We're speaking right now in the English language, but the word truth in the English language, you know, there are a lot of twists and turns, but its actual origin is in tvath. And you hear the word vath in there? Its origins were actually in what is worthy of faith. Now, a lot of people today think truth is supposed to be, dec to be as secular as possible, to be you know, taken out of that context, but it's about what is worthy of faith. And we often make the mistake of trying to just translate everything into the way we talk about truth as if they're the same thing. So for instance, there are people who would translate the Greek aletheia into truth, but it's not the same thing because aletheia means to disclose. Okay, And you can see how that connects to the question of evidentiality. Some people translate it into the Latin veritas. But that doesn't quite work either, because you could see its connection to verification, which means, in effect, you can point out, you can verify. But that's not really the same thing. And in fact, we know this because we live in a world right now. We used to say, for instance, if we could just disclose 
the atrocities, if we think about police violence, if we could just show it, people could see the truth. But as we know all over the world, today with our technology, we show police violence all the time. And police officers go before juries and get acquitted. Although the evidence, the disclosure, the verification, all those things are right there. And that is because, you see, the missing element is not simply about the evidence and its evidentiality, but it's about also the willingness to put faith in the value of that evidence and its evidentiality. Of course, at the moment, I just gave a story in European languages. But if we go even further back to languages that go back at least about 12 to 20,000 years, like Meduneter, you have Bumait. And Ma'at is connected to having the right organization, the right constellation of things in such a way that you can actually do what is appropriate. And so there's a form of appropriateness that's connected to truth that could compel us, as the saying goes, to do the right thing. So I begin first, not only with the acknowledgement around ancestors and descendants, but it's not simply about biological notions. In a way, the speakers who spoke before me are ancestors because there is a presence of their presentation even though they're now in the past. And so I also acknowledge those who spoke before me because a lot of what I have to say not only connects to what they have said, but as you could see, we're part of a living conversation on the topics at hand, okay? And so, we come to this question of the meeting, Fanon, Hope, and the Day After. I heard earlier the David Marriott book brought up. The thing about the David Marriott book is the David Marriott book, book um, is a rationalization of Fanon as an Afro-pessimist. And that should already put you on alert. <laughs> but, but, my interest here is not to quit, you know, go into any squabbles with Marriott or any of those other people, because that's ultimately a distraction. We'll start first with a basic observation from Fanon. And the observation, I guess I'll come over here, it'll be easier for you to see. The observation goes back to something he saw when he was a medical student and what he realized throughout his career. And what that is, in a nutshell, is that there are, patient, <clears throat> there are individuals who will seek his help. They would seek his help and say, they'll come to the physician and say, I'm suffering. I'm angry, I'm hurt. I need help. And Fanon noticed something. And what he noticed was that not everybody who came to psychiatrists were actually people who were ill. In other words, their so-called illness, paradoxically, was a function of their actually being healthy. Now, what do I mean? Well, it's healthy to be pissed off at degradation, dehumanization, oppression. It's healthy to be upset if you are dealing with the everyday violence on your humanity. If you're a pissed off woman in a sexist world, you know what you are? A healthy woman. If you're a pissed off black person, a pissed off indigenous person, it means you're recognizing a wrong. And that's why in his writings, Fanon made a distinction between clients and patients. However, 
if someone came to Fanon who were angry not about the systemic degradation of her, him, and the people, but actually pissed off about it happening personally to me versus others, Fanon called that an unhealthy person. Because that person was imbued with narcissism. And in fact, one of the funny things about Fanon's, it was, the question was brought up of his clinical writings. There are a lot of people these days are, uh, talking about Fanon's psychiatric and clinical writings, but they just announce it. They don't actually talk about them. <laughs> the Marriott book doesn't actually do it. It just says it because it makes you seem scholarly. But the actual thing, not only in his dissertation on Friedrich Ataxia, but in other writings, the main thing he, he noticed was something very peculiar, something very unusual. And that is, he noticed that neurological illness and mental illness were not identical. Okay? And when he tried to look at mental illness versus neurological illness, he noticed a pattern, which is that mental illness for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, had a lot to do with narcissism. In other words, he concluded it's unhealthy for people to be obsessed with thinking about themselves all the time. You know, when it's always all about me, 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 that's unhealthy. In that regard, Fanon influenced and was part of a, a rather stellar group of individuals who argued against malignant narcissism. In fact, if you look at the writings of Ali Shariati, Ali Shariati pointed out that one of the prisons we have in the Euro-modern world is the obsession with the self. We, thinking about ourselves too much, imprison ourselves. But we could add to Shariati a reflection that links beautifully with a lot of what Hoya Garcia was talking about from the Japanese thinker, Nishitani, Kai, Kaiji Nishitani. And Nishitani's observation was that many of us fail to understand the extent to which our obsession with being covers over reality. And this is a striking thing, because one of the things you learn in the Western Academy is there's nothing greater than the ontological. But much of indigenous thought, and in this case, Zen Buddhist thought, basically says that's wrong. There's reality beyond ontology. Yeah. And one of the reasons we can say this is because for being, even to come into being, meant there had to have not been a period of being, which means being can go out of being. And as a consequence, the obsession with the self is so linked to being that it leads to taking the self a little too seriously. And so once we realize that there is more to reality than being, we begin now to get into a more radical critique of how we deal with some of the questions, even of notions of health. Now, the thing about Fanon in that, those earlier writings that some people don't pay attention to is that one of the things he observed, particularly in the Maghreb, when he looked at other forms of therapy connected to mental illness, he noticed something very peculiar about them. In other words, not from Western clinical psychiatry, but really what communities developed to deal with the mentally ill. And what he noticed that was peculiar about them was that they worked. Everything he's taught him is to say that these are primitives. What they do must fail and the we the agents of being, the agents of the self, must intervene and make them healthy. And so if now we're dealing with the fact that that intervention is actually making them unhealthy, what's going on? 
Well, I'll give you an example. And what I'm going to do is, because the time is limited, as Oscar pointed out, I'm just going to move in three rapid directions after the example, OK? So forgive me for the rapidity of my talk after the example. A couple of months ago, I was speaking in Norman, Oklahoma. And I was meeting with um, the Native American Studies Department. And we had a wonderful lunch with 35 students and colleagues from many nations across the Americas. There were people from Apache to Mohawk to um, Choctaw. When I opened them, I said, Holito, that's Choctaw for good morning. Hello. And the way I usually have these conversations is there's a large circle, and each person speaks. And I actually would be the last person to speak, and then we break it into a full conversation. But now and then I may say something if someone speaks, just to make a point as we go along. So the third, remember I said there were 35. The third speaker was a young man who opened up and said he had ADHD. So forgive him, he can't pay attention to things, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, you know, what's very strange is um, I often hear about ADHD, but in all my years of teaching, I've never had a problem with it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, there is a conception of what it is to be a proper thinker as focusing on one thing. But there are many people, myself included, who simultaneously pay attention to many things. And that's because nothing exists out of relationship with other things. <laughs> so some people need to focus on things one at a time. But if you're in a community, it's very helpful to have somebody who's paying attention always to the larger picture. And so maybe I said to him, that which has been pathologized in you as having a disorder may be an advantage, especially in this context. And so I said, maybe you're just an associational thinker. So then we proceeded. Now remember, I said there were 35 people. So that meant there were 32 other people to speak before, and then some professors, and then I spoke. After two hours of these people speaking, it came back to him. And this young man, interestingly enough, commented on what every one of them said. And he never once interrupted them when they spoke. And as the con near the end of the conversation, I, um, I said to him, um, you know, I know you opened up with saying you had ADHD, but the classic pathological conception is one, you not pay attention to your colleagues. Two, you will interrupt them constantly. <laughs> and three, that means you would not be able to process what they have said. However, not only did he process what they said, I just described, but in fact, every member of that room was a contributor to an important conversation. And in fact, there was one woman who spoke for 20 minutes straight on her trauma. And he processed, processed it. Now, that context was one, interestingly enough, in which being able to understand himself as a contributor rather than a burden to the community enabled him to perform. It's similar to an allegory I use about music. I often bring up when I um, sometimes play music, sometimes I play piano, and in those contexts, there's a piano that may be out of tune, and I love playing out of tune pianos. I remember one place I played an out-of-tune piano, and my, the, you know, but, but, but when I went to play it, my host went up and said, no, no, it's out-of-tune. I said, no, it doesn't matter. <coughs> and when I played it, they came back and they scratched their head and said, we thought it was out-of-tune. I said, it is. And the message, of course, is just because you're out-of-tune doesn't mean you can't make music. <laughs> 
Think about that as an allegory of society. See, the, the mistake that we often make is that we gotta tune everybody. And if we're so obsessed with tuning everybody, we forget the music. We forget that music can be played in many ways. And especially if you're thinking about the question of democracy or larger life beyond human life, the kind of harmonies and also the beauty of dissonance can make that what we could call life music. Now, the context, and this is the rapid fire part because there are other speakers to come. So we begin with the context. We already know, bless you, the context is one of an historical reality of colonization, degradation, dehumanization, etc. And to talk about that context, we need first to address certain fictions. Now I make, I'm going to stress, I make a distinction between myth and fiction. Many people make the mistake of thinking myths are fictitious. But what they don't understand is that fiction versus fact are irrelevant to myth. Myth is about meaning. And so if we make the distinction between myth and fiction, we're able to move more productively. For instance, myth is always around. When I look at this Birkbeck thing here, I think it's Birkbeck, you see the Owl of Minerva, that's a myth. <laughs> the very fact that that's there already establishes the idea that this is supposed to be a Western order of knowledge because of the Hegelian presupposition that thought matures at sunset. That's a myth. But there are many other kinds of myths with which we should deal. But so, I am not against myth, and I'll explain why a little later. But a fiction, we do have political fictions. Political fiction one, somewhere out there, there's a group of people who got it, whatever it is, right. That's one political fiction. Another political fiction is that everything just depends on the size of the crowd. If you could get a big enough crowd, you resolve everything. <laughs> now, of course, the subtext of both are forms of epistemological imprisonment. Because one, the notion of perfect people, means you just have to follow what they say as if what they say pertains to every context. Who says their context is yours? And the part about the crowd, the subtext of the crowd, is really force. And force, as we know, is not the same thing as legitimacy. And so we now deal with another context. Because if Fanon says to the client, you know, the problem isn't that you are mentally ill. The problem is that you live in an unjust, cruel society. Then the logical response is to go out and do something. And in fact, Fanon said it very well. The argument is to be actional. And so if you're going to go out and do something, you have to do something about the society. But the society, at that moment when you go out, you're facing a society in a way that requires decisions. And this is really crucial. Because you see, once we look at this, it means that you face what's called a crisis. And many people don't reflect on what a crisis is. Crisis is from the word krenain, which means to decide, the decision. And the decider is called a krites. And the decider decides upon criteria. But the thing about it is that when you have to make a decision, the mistake we make is that we don't think, we presume, in fact, that decisions are ultimately straightforward and linear. But decisions have 
are, are heavily laden with political implications. For instance, right now all across the globe, we talk in terms of the right and the left. But we talk about the right and the left as if they're symmetrical. All right? So I guess, see the problem is I'm looking at you, so this is my left. <laughs> but for you I have to do it like a, an actor, so the right and the left. And because you have two hands, you think of them symmetrically. But the right and the left are not symmetrical. They have radically different goals radically different purposes. The right are th those whose response to the crisis is always to say you must go back. In other words, the problem with the present first is the fact that you have to make a decision. And that creates a fundamental anxiety, a fundamental concern, because the situation of having to make a decision is treated as a situation of disorder. So for the right, you have to return to order. And that's why the right is always, in fact, obsessed with the words law and order. So let's say you decide to go to the right. Well, now you're looking for order, but you have now defined disorder as a problem, which means dissent is a problem, difference is a problem. So you must seek homogeneity. You must eliminate difference. And you all know this. That's why the right always leads to xenophobia, racism, the radicalization of sexism in a society where there is gendered difference, Anxiety against sexuality, because paradoxically, although same sex should sound homogeneous, the idea is that it violates the order of heteronormativity. So it is different, eradicate it. And if you push it far enough, you have to have extreme order, which is why you get fascism. And ultimately, the problem, of course, is that there's always somebody who's not identical with the self, which that's why fascists always, always ultimately turn upon fascists. That's why there's never been a fascist order that has been able to last. But of course, there's already a fallacy in how we think about lasting. So let's now go to the liberals, the center. The liberals have a problem because you see what I just described is the world according to a man from this island, I love calling, uh, you know, England, this, this whole area, an island. You need to, you need to embrace your islandness. <laughs> so this island, and these islands, the British Isles, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, was able to argue this because he had a, he, he already has within it. This idea that you must seek order because he already has that's linked to it, a conception of the human being that is based on the philosophical anthropology and I don't have time to get into details of it, so I'll just give one element. I don't believe in reductionistic thinking. There are always more elements, you got it? Always more elements. Just like when we talked about psychoanalysis, the error we make is we talk about psychoanalysis as a European phenomenon. The truth is psychoanalysis has existed in our species from the moment our species began to interpret reality. Because interpretation requires saying there's always something beneath what you see. Okay? So the philosoph but among the things is in capitalism, the philosophical anthropology of capitalism is the idea of the human being as a self-contained metaphysical whole, W-H-O-L-E as a substance, a thing. And so from the Hobbesian world, the human being is like a bowling ball, rolling around, and the big issue is whether you collide with other bowling balls. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the valorization of evasion and collision, okay? And if you think about it, that's the way 
conservatives talk about people today. The problem is people who don't think of themselves as conservatives, as Shariati pointed out, also talk about people that way, which means their logic buys into it. You see it in many ways. It's always funny to me whenever I come to the UK, but it's also the same issue in Canada. Anglo, Anglo and, and more Lutheran, Protestant-oriented ways of seeing people is very funny. I love going to Derbyshire and watch English people walking together in love. You know how they walk together in love? Beside each other and not talking to each other. <laughs> you go to Mexico, people in love hold hands, they're kissing, they could be 90 years old, they're slurping each other. But Anglo people in passionate love walk side by side. They're bowling balls, okay? But then now, so the liberal model accepts the bowling ball model. And because of that, it has an epistemology that collapses all reality into self-contained opinion. If you look at John Stuart Mill, it's all about opinion. It's never actually the way when I tapped those drums in the beginning. I did that on purpose because, you see, I was, we were communicating, you were listening, but not just listening, in your heart, in your movements. We were part of a community of language beyond the question of narrow report and back and forth. One of the big mistakes is that we tend to look at language in a way that centers what is a tiny fragment of what we do when we communicate. And if we could open ourselves up the way I talked about those untuned notes and chords, we can communicate in a more rich way. But the liberal model, basically because it simply says opinion, it means there's no way to connect beyond the bowling ball model. And as a consequence, it means that you, have to, you, you simply have to tolerate the existence of the bowling ball model as the proper way to look at people. The problem is the conservatives are busy saying, we need to get rid of difference, including the liberals. <laughs> so that means the liberals have to tolerate the very people who are trying to destroy them. And that's why the logic of force comes in and liberalism has no defense against fascism. So now you have another model. Another model looks at the past and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Every time I look at history, what I see are human beings trying to make things better. That's why we figured out cooking. That's why we figured out soap. That's why we figured out spirituality. That's why we worked on language, all kinds of things. And we're always trying to find a way to fit. And this is a very important thing to realize. Because when I gave the Nishitani example about being covering over reality, you know what that means? It means that being and existence are not identical. Existence is to stand out of being. And that means something that a lot of people don't really talk about, but I don't have time, so I'm just going to lay it out there. It means existence is queer. It's queer. Queer. See, today when we talk about queer, we try to reinscribe being by locking queerness exclusively into sexuality. We forget about the erotic life. We forget about the very notion that existence is always out of line. We are quintessentially the creatures that never fit. And because we never fit, we're always trying to get things to work. The history of ideas is a long struggle about people who are trying to de-queer us, which is to put us in our place in being. <laughs> That's the conservatism. 
But when we realize that, like those on two notes, we live according to relationships that are very different, then what we realize then is that it doesn't matter where you go back in history, it's not that there was a perfect group of people who had it right, it's that in an effort to try to live better, people develop things that may be useful today and things that may not. And as a consequence, it just means the crisis is our turn of trying to figure out what would work under the conditions we live in. And this is one of the problems of our times because there's some people look at the crises of today and say, you know what the problem is? We need to figure out which century had it right. So the conservatives, I just said Hobbes, they want the 17th and eight, into 18th century, Hobbes and Locke and those types. Mm -hmm. And then there are those, the Marxists, who say, no, 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 it's a 19th century. And I am not an anti-Marxist, I just want to say that. The problem I have is that many Marxists don't realize that they're not Marxists. <laughs> because what they want to do is collapse Marxism into a closed dialectic when all it is is their turn to figure out open in a dialectical way the contradictions to move forward. So then there are some people say, no, 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 it's the 20th century. But the problem is the 20th century is remembered as an age of revolutions. And this is one of the big problems because there's been a good hatchet job on the concept of revolution that many people are locked in a logic that forecloses revolutionary and liberatory thinking. But the problem we have now is that we are facing something very different. Because you see, in previous centuries, people are always trying to figure out the problematics of the next century. And there's a reason for this. If you look at the end of the 19th century, people were thinking about the 20th century. But what's weird is people, most people in the 21st century are not thinking about the 22nd. They're not even thinking about the mid-21st century. <laughs> There's some people who can't even think five years from, about five years from now. And that tells you about a fundamental nihilism with which we are struggling. And one of the reasons that's connected to this struggle is precisely because part of the epistemological bullying of fascism is to foreclose our ability to think. Now, if we start with those who have to think about how to make things better, there are different types. There are some people who think about making things better simply by being against things such as states, institutions, etc. In other words, they think if you can get rid of stuff, then you will have freedom. The problem with that is it confuses liberty with freedom. Liberty and freedom are not identical. The absence of an impediment may afford you license, but not necessarily freedom, because the rub of freedom is that freedom always has responsibility. When I talked about crisis and making decisions, all decisions carry responsibility. When we think about theory, for instance, the mistake many people think, make is that they think theory can exist by itself to establish a relationship with reality. But if you think of all metaphors of theory, and again, I don't have time to get into detail, they're all connected to sight. Theory is about what you can see. And the mistake many people have made, many thinkers, particularly in the Euromodern age, is to think the task of theory is demythification to eliminate myth. The problem, however, is that myth, from the word muthaus, which means mouth, from the mouth, must be narrated, must be spoken. Myth, in being spoken and narrated, means that it's repeated, which means every myth has a myth beneath the myth. So meaning is produced mythically. And you could see the problem. Because if you can see 
but you lack meaning. Now you have a big problem about your relationship with reality because you'll have meaningless notions of truth. You need both. And if you bring this together, how meaning and seeing relate, then you're dealing with what's called livability, which comes back to the question of health. See, the reason the conversation with that student in, Nor in, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma or Fanon's observation with his patients, or when he went to the Maghreb, why those worked was because they were a meeting of theory and meaning. The reason certain clinical models fail is because they seek theory without meaning. You see? Meaning is always intimate. And you know what intimacy means. It means meaning is always erotic. And in fact, if we look at the, we're right now we're in a global war, so to speak. The global war from the right, connected to that bowling ball model, is the radicalization of privatization. And that means at a global scale, it's to reduce the capacity of people to connect with each other. It is the radicalization of disempowerment. What is democracy on a global scale? Democracy on a global scale would be the radicalization of getting rid of the bowling ball model and, com and having the communicative connected model, which means, and this is really problematic for Protestant Christianity, because it means that fundamentally at the heart of all forms of radical democracy is erotic cohesion. It means ultimately dealing with the feared queerness of which I spoke. So, I'm going to conclude now to connect to the theme, hope. Because of course, other than the libertarian model, if we talk about the freedom model, it means there's no freedom, as Simone de Beauvoir pointed out, in which your freedom requires the diminishing of the freedom of others. That is the intimacy. What she understood is that we connect with freedom. You see? In Jorge's, it's OK if I say Jorge. In Jorge's talk, what he was trying to point out is the connectedness beyond simply ourselves here. And this connectedness requires taking responsibility for things that may challenge our sense of security. Instead of, you know what I'm saying? Instead of being a collision, it requires being an openness, which is a radical form of vulnerability. It's what in feminist thought, okay, is called fear of the feminine, okay? Now, when we talk about hope, we, just, we often announce it in the form of a platitude. But to understand hope, you need to understand faith. And remember that I opened up with dvath, which is connected to faith, that which is worthy of your faith. But faith is a very difficult concept. Because you see, and just to move very quickly, you cannot have faith without going through an experience of infinite resignation. It's what, it's interesting, it's not only what Kierkegaard pointed out, it's not only what Luther pointed out, it's also what Siri Arabindo pointed out, it's also pointed out, it's, 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 in, it's in all kinds of thinking in the Global South as well. Infinite resignation is when everything around you tells you that what you want is impossible. Okay? That's what infinite resignation is. Okay? So all acts of faith require the leap 
over infinite resignation. But hope is different. And this is a tricky thing because you see, um, the liberal model, but not just liberal, many other, hope is when you fall short of infinite resignation. It's when things look bad, but you're hoping. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Epistemologically, hope is already rooted in the idea that there's an, open, there's a, there's an opening out there. However, this leads, and this comes back to the point I said about the Marriott book, this is where we get into some serious problems. And again, I'm, I, 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 it's not enough time, but right now, the language of the debate has been so locked, not only in hope, but in pessimism and optimism. And pessimists argue, oh, the problem with you optimists is, you know, don't you understand? Um, we're not going to put, put faith in those things, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is contemporary pessimists keep using the language of ontology. And this is where they have the contradiction. If it's ontological, then it's impossible. So if it's ontological, pessimism wouldn't be the right word. You see? So the moment the pessimists use pessimism as a language, they're actually really the other side of optimism. Ultimately, optimists and pessimists don't realize they're the same. And now we get into something more radical. Because you see, the way I talked about faith is very existential. And what's different about the existential is that the existential, because it already stood out from being, challenges the ontological. And this means then, the existential rupture looks to the future with a different question. See, the mistake we make is that we keep through ontology, go into epistemology, and use the language of forecast. If you need to have a lore, a guarantee, for you to act politically, then you're foreclosing the gravity of the problems at hand. I usually illustrate it this way. If you think about our ancestors, who faced an absolute notion of the impossibility of a future. The question we ask is, how and why then did they act? And we know they acted because of the way this room looks. Even though this institution was founded, for instance, on class as a category, we already know that class in particularly the UK just means white even though most people in the working class and the underclass and the poor are of color. So class is a language often to just evade color. And so even though this was founded on class, something happened to transform this institution to, and meetings like this to look this way. And the answer is because people acted. And this is the thing that's missing, a lot like people who think you have to have a tuned piano to play music, which is facing that infinite resignation. The question isn't about optimism. It isn't about pessimism. It isn't actually even about hope, okay? The question is actually about commitment. You see, the political challenge, the liberation challenge, is about our commitments. What are we going to do where the issue of failure even becomes irrelevant? You know, we often think about failure in a very personalized way. If we think about it that way, then those ancestors who acted failed because in their lifetime, they never got to see a room like this. 
Yet what we know is a room like this absolutely depended upon their actions. So did they fail? You see the tricky part? And that's because we don't realize that the issue of assessing human action is not actually like the bowling ball model about whether that bowling ball failed. It isn't about the instrumental, I mean the individual keys on the piano. It's about the constellation of the music made. And when we understand this, and we understand that to act politically is always to act about something that is always greater than you. If it's all about you, you're back into the narcissism. And in fact, and Fanon talked about love in this regard, it brings the challenge on, of the question of how to think about love. You see, the mentally ill, narcissistic model thinks about love this way. I love you because you're like me. Which means when you think of the future, what do you want to do? Reproduce yourself. And anybody who's a parent in this room knows that makes you a really horrible parent. <laughs> because it means your child doesn't have the freedom of her, his, or they, their life. But there's another kind of love. We human beings have the capacity to love that which is not identical to us. We have the ability to love in such a way that we understand that descending the conditions for the freedom, not simply of other human beings, but freedom for the livability of what is to come. There might be future creatures that are nothing like us, but the understanding of the joys and the celebration of their freedom are part of what we are to do. And that is the meaning by Hind, I would argue, the closing remark in Le Dagne de la Terre, the damned of the earth. Because when he said to build new concepts, it's that act of love that's not about the sameness and identity with the self. And although he closed it with saying a new humanity, what he means by that is a humanity that doesn't look at itself the way Nietzsche talked about the last man. The last man believes that it's all about him. And if it's not a reproduction of him, then there's no point. In other words, Trump, Bosneros, <laughs> you know, all of these, these, these folks in India, all over the world, who are doing that. But there's another understanding of the human being as over, as, getting, as not full of ourselves. As, free, as freed of the attachment of making ourselves into the only thing that matters. And if we're over ourselves, we may have the opportunity to begin to build our actual possibilities. I'm done. Thank you. Oh, there it is. <laughs> 
Um, thank you, Nelson and uh, Foundation Fran Fanon for bringing us here. And thank you to uh, Oscar, Kojo, and Focus on Funk Collective uh, for hosting us. Um, we've been really excited about this conference, and it's been really amazing to be here since yesterday, especially with Ash's uh, keynote and the amazing uh, performance both by um, the Funk Collective and also Jock. And then today, uh, it's been amazing to hear Lara and Steven and, and Luis, because I think a lot of what they're saying is also where we're coming from, from our own context. Um, so we are decolonized this place. Uh, I'm, Ami I'm, I'm Amin, I'm saying, I'm Natasha. <laughs> this is Mars and that's Amin. And there's uh, 10 of us. So today when we're gonna talk about uh, our work, there's many of us. So it's not just the three of us. We are here um, talking on behalf of uh, many uh, people. Um, so we've also been part of many movements over the last 10 years. And we've also been part of their successes and their failures. And so starting from Occupy Wall Street to Direct Action Front for Palestine, to doing solidarity work with uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, solidarity work with Standing Rock, um, Strike Debt, and also the Gulf Labor Coalition. Um, the reason why we mention all of this is because we're really interested in the idea of the training in practice of freedom, right? So um, as, as you know, was brought back, like we think about decolonization as something where land, water, and air is central. And then then how does that translate into action? And then what does solidarity mean from that perspective, right? And also, as, uh, as was pointed out earlier, that uh, this entire process is also about conversation and process. And what does the process of, like, let's say, giving the land back look like? Or like, what does process mean for us in terms of building decolonial solidarity when we have been dehumanized, right? And so one of the problems that has been there in the New York City movement organizing world is that we live in issue silos. Right? Everybody, we know that this specificity of our struggles is very important. Indigenous sovereignty, black liberation, free Palestine, dismantling patriarchy, these are extremely important struggles. But how do we then build relations within them, and, uh, and, and, and especially when there is a lot of trauma in our movements, and when there is, uh, you know, like for example, if you're talking about indigenous sovereignty, we have to begin with the idea that we are on stolen land in the United States, right? And um, another thing is uh, we're in Britain, and like we come from histories of like Britain fucking up our borders, like India shouldn't look the way it does, Punjab shouldn't look the way it does, Palestine should not look the way it does. So we're also here to talk about abolition, because uh, decolonization is not complete without abolition. Abolition of a society that requires prisons, as Fred Moden says. Uh, and so that's, that's the kind of solidarity that we want to build. So I'm just going to show a few images of some of our actions, and then Mars um, will take on, and then Amin will go on. So this is just a sticker, uh, decolonize this sticker. We have some of them right out here uh, for you to take. Put them wherever you feel like needs to be decolonized. <laughs> Um, so these two images are from our uh, movement space. Um, so also the idea of the undercommons, right? So we, we're in the institution right now, but uh, when institutions like, for example, Artist Space in New York City offered us a three month uh, exhibition, we took the space. Now Artist Space in New York City is in downtown Manhattan. The rent of that place in itself is like $18,000 a month, right? So this is the art space putting up exhibitions, political exhibitions, every single exhibition they have. So when we get this space, we're like, how can we make this into a movement uh, commons? But not just a, a cultural space where there's programming, but it's also an action-oriented space. And so uh, we had like, you know, uh, potlucks, food parties, um, film screenings, but they were all rooted in the idea of organizing and doing actions. And that's where the six strands uh, for decolonize this place also come from, which is indigenous sovereignty, black liberation, free Palestine, uh, degentrification, which is very important because New York City, and I'm sure that's also important for London, um, and then also dismantling patriarchy. So I'm going to jump very quickly to, um, how do you actually build this solidarity amongst groups? Like, how do you actually think about targets? And how do you think of sites of injustices that our bodies can map and then bring about the coalition that we are talking about? A lot of people talk, talk to us about, like, uh, they think that we are protesters or activists. We actually blur the lines between art, aesthetics, research, organizing, and we do not believe in any of these categories. And in fact, when we're doing some of our actions, the way we think about them is not just as going as negation in front of this institution, but also creating a space that 
that we would like to create. It's our space, right? So how do you go to these dead zones, so to say? Like, for example, we go to the American Museum of Natural History. How do we go to these dead zones and activate them with, from our, with our bodies, but also not just the logic of reason and, and everything that you were talking about? Like, how do we actually enact that in a space and then build solidarity? So uh, Warren Kanders, he, is, um, he runs this company called Safari Land. It is the biggest tear gas manufacturing company. The tear gas that Safari Land produces is used, uh, was used in Standing Rock, Ferguson, Baltimore, Egypt, Palestine, Turkey, recently in Chile. And this particular action started because the tear gas was used on Tijuana, Tijuana border in the United States. And Warren Kanders, he is the vice chairman of the Whitney Museum of Art, was the vice chairman of the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. He, in fact, resigned the same day as the governor of Puerto Rico did. And like, you know, during this entire time, um, that was a very strong struggle that we were part of because also the Warren Kanders tear gas was also being used in Puerto Rico while um, these things were happening. So then we did this thing called Nine Weeks of Art in Action, where the idea was that we start from, um, uh, the, uh, like from crisis to decolonization. Because even though we had been doing a lot of work on the ground, people doesn't, did not know what decolonization means tangibly, right? And so like walking through that process, and in that process, then building solidarity with different groups. And so um, I'm just like, I'm just gonna show the image for week nine. Um, this was one of our posters, and then um, the last, uh, the, you know, the week one, for example, we had songs, we had teach-ins, we had potlucks, we had dabka, we had, uh, you know, reggaeton dance party, we had, like, you know, um, a, a student movement come through, and then finally, for the last day, we actually walked to Warren Kander's house, which is very close to the Whitney Museum. For so a place like New York City, that's insane, right? But, like, if you think about organizers from a like day-to-day -day movement, you think like, yeah, you go to the people's houses and you tell them like how they're really fucked up. But in New York City, that was a big deal that you went to Warren Candace's house, specifically because he is responsible for this cultural philanthropy that is not just related to the Whitney Museum. It then further connects to all these other institutions that uh, Mars is gonna pick up from. Oh, and then I think uh, just about the decolonial formation, if you wanna bring it. Oh, okay. And then, yeah, so, um, like, one of the things that happened during the nine weeks of uh, organizing was also our relationship to abolitionist movements in the city became much stronger, groups like No New Gels, and specifically also a lot of the gentrification groups because cultural institutions are also extremely uh, uh, displacing a lot of communities. So like art is a huge weapon of mass displacement in New York City, and I mean it transfers everywhere else as well. And so um, through this, what happened was going through these nine weeks, we were able to, and I think this is really important because it's not just about listing out names of groups um, that are present or who sign on on the press release or any of that. It's actually relationships and care that you have to build across struggles to be able to get anywhere, right? So conversations about, you know, how is indigenous sovereignty related to, you know, the black liberation movement, to, you know, fuck ICE or like abolition or border movements is a real conversation that is part of tactic and, tactics and strategy while you're targeting these institutions or being on the streets when you say fuck the police. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nit. Um, so the next action we're going to talk about, if we can scroll down, um, is the Ford Foundation. So the Ford Foundation, um, when we came to this action, we found ourselves in a post Candors moment. Um, as Natasha mentioned, Warren Candors resigned at the end of July, um, the same day that the governor of Puerto Rico resigned, um, which, was a, which was a great moment for our movement. Um, in the post Candors moment, um, this idea of toxic <laughs> philanthropy was really huge in New mm -hmm. York City. People were writing about it left and right. Um, what do you do if you, if you have to accept money from somewhere, whose money is good money and whose money is bad money? That kind of became the conversation, including with Darren Walker, who is the president of the Ford Foundation. So the Ford Foundation actually funds most of our social justice initiatives um, <laughs> in New York City and around the country, um, which is really interesting. Um, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, Darren Walker, after Candace resigned, called all of, all of his museum director and his institution president buddies into a secret meeting and was kind of like, what the fuck do we do now? Oh, and by the way, I support the building of four new jails in New York City. And it's like, oh, cool, so you're about social justice, but you're not an abolitionist. Um, to which he responds with uh, an article around 
of people needing to respect nuance, right? And 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 we us not understanding the nuance of the situation. Um, liberal contradiction at its finest. Um, more humane jails. Oh yeah, and then the the thing is, is we shouldn't abolish jails. We just need more humane jails, right? That's that's what he was talking about. Um, as Natasha said, um, there's been a campaign in New York City, uh, the New York City chapter of No New Jails, against the building of these four new jails. And in fact, a member um, from that squad went to an event in which Angela Davis was speaking at and asked her what her opinion was around the building of new jails in New York City and what should be done about the Ford Foundation. How do we hold them accountable, given the fact that Darren Walker is a queer black man um, who, who puts out there that he wants to, to be a beacon of light in the communities, to which Angela Davis responds that someone needs to protest the Ford Foundation. Um, so we organize with No New Jails, um, Take Back the Bronx and other crews um, to do so. We have um, a two minute clip of this longer clip of just like what the atmosphere there was like. What was interesting here was a few things. Um, one is the move from museums into other institutions, but also realizing at this point that there really is no binary of inside and outside of the institution. Um, the Ford Foundation is, in, is a good example of that as it's an institution that directly affects the outside, the outside life of the city. Um, this also produced a new relationship with the police. Um, one reason why we organized in museums first was because they're private institutions. So the NYPD actually cannot come in and arrest you unless they're invited by the institution to do so. Now, if you're working with a progressive museum like the Whitney, that's the last thing <laughs> they want to do is have people arrested. So they deal with things as much as they can, right? The Ford Foundation at first acted as though we didn't have that knowledge, right? So they were working hand in hand with the NYPD and they were about to make arrests as we started our protests, to which Amin actually uh, put on a lawyer hat and was just <laughs> like, hey, actually that's, uh, unless Darren Walker like called the police on us, which would be wild, you can't arrest us, in which the police then backed up. Um, so that's like, it, it's interesting in the, in the narrative that's coming around like our new form uh, relationship with the police. But. Palestine always. It doesn't even fucking matter where you are. It's fucking free Palestine. You're at these actions and it's like, from the river to the sea. You're like, Palestine, Palestine will be free. You're like, all right. I didn't know we were here for that. For that. <laughs> I mean, cool. That's cool too. Yeah. Um, so what was interesting about that is our decolonial formation looked a lot different then because we started this move to the streets, right? Um, so the art world, you know, where the fuck were they? I don't know, but <laughs> all of a sudden they weren't that concerned. Um, but also, like Indigenous Peoples Day, we usually roll with over a thousand people. But I, we wanted to show that video clip to show like our actions with smaller groups. That speaking of um, uh, this idea of numbers and force um, was actually really powerful action. Didn't need a thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, 
But so um, for the last four years on Indigenous Peoples Day, um, we've been working with groups such as the American Indian Community House, the Indigenous Kinship Collective, Samias Collective, amongst others, um, to in the movement to one, rename the day from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, which I know seems wild, but we're still dealing with that on the East Coast somehow um, in the US. Um, but also against the American Museum of Natural History, in the top left photo there, you can kind of see uh, this picture of a statue of Theodore Roosevelt um, on a stallion flanked by two nearly naked men, one of indigenous descent and one of African descent. Um, and the, his whole fucked up, like, going to go conserve the world mentality and colonize Puerto Rico and all this other bullshit. Um, so remove the statue and then respect the ancestors. So we all know that, like, I mean, you have the British Museum here when you talk about things like repatriation and reparations, um, thinking through the ways in which that museum literally enslaved a man, his name was Oda Benga, um, at one point in time, and just their legacies there of eugenics, all of this. Um, but this year we wanted to, uh, we realized that this was a different moment. People's energies weren't necessarily in like, let's go into this museum again. Um, instead, how do we find a way to take that analysis and map it out over the city in a more expanded sense? So we marched from the American Museum of Natural History, which is on the Upper West Side, through Central Park, uh, and ended up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is on the Upper East Side. We started with um, decolonization um, to root the day in indigeneity um, with the Indigenous Kinship Collective. And then we went on an unpermitted march uh, north in which we then entered the park and to Seneca Village to talk about abolition. Um, Seneca Village was an African-American uh, home base. That was where Central Park is now. Um, before Central Park, in the, in the city's first use of eminent domain, imminent imminent domain. domain they yeah. took the land um, from that community to make Central Park. Um, so that's two times over now that that land was stolen. Um, so to talk about abolition, then we moved to Central Park, where you could see the, high the skyline of the Midtown, to talk about displacement and anti-gentrification efforts. Um, to the obelisk to talk about um, international struggles and anti-imperialism. The obelisk, right, from Egypt, and there's three in the world. Cleopatra's and, needle. Yeah, and somehow uh, one of them is in Central Park. Um, who knows? Um, and then we ended up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is in the lower right-hand corner there, um, to talk about anti-capitalism. Um, that day we had um, about over a thousand folks come through, and we worked with. Um, what, how many groups? Probably like, 30. yeah, 30 groups that time, which was crazy from the first time we put on the anti columbus Day tour. I think there were two to two four, groups. two groups. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, the la and I'll just introduce um, uh, the FTP, the recent FTP actions. So the, the cops and during the Indigenous Peoples Day, they actually worked with the museum to shut the museum down in, in anticipation that we would go into the museum, which we did not. So now the cops, hated us for calling them out at Ford Foundation, and they felt dumb as hell closing the museum down on Indigenous Peoples Day, and then we called to fuck the police action. So it was just like, all right, what's happening here? And the reason why is because Cuomo, the governor of New York, uh, signed off on adding 500 new cops to the MTA, to our subway system. Um, at the end of October, um, as these new cops were deployed, there were several incidents, one of which where eight to 12 cops were at um, a station in Brooklyn pointing their guns into a train car at an unarmed 19-year-old black male, Adrian Napier, um, who was just on his way to work. And the reason was because he didn't have $2.75 to pay the train fare. So that was their reason for, for that. Um, another video, this is a video that went viral. Another video that went viral was, um, uh, of cops, of this white cop actually uh, beating 15-year-old black uh, children. Um, sorry, I'm gonna look this up. On the subway train, and can you scroll to the thing? Uh, beating up 15-year-old black children, the turnstile hopping, um, on, on another train stop in Brooklyn. Um, and then these videos kept flooding in. And so we decided that we wanted to act um, and the decolonial formation that we formed earlier from the museum actions and what was happening in terms of 
the Ford Foundation was already in place to, to do that. Um, okay. So before I pass it to Amin, um, for us, when we play this video, um, which is one part like uh, a mass fare evasion that took place, where um, hundreds of people hopped the turnstile um, in front of the police, um, we were just thinking of how direct action is necessary in the training of practice of freedom, how Fanon discusses the ways in which tension builds within the bodies of the colonized over time, how Nes Nelson talks about coloniality and modernity and how it grabs a hold of the senses and knowledges and beings, and how decoloniality necessitates a reorientation of our logics, affects, and affiliations. So the goals of this action, one of many, was definitely uh, along those lines of reorienting ourselves towards each other. Yeah, we're just going to keep it brief yeah. again. Hold on, let me just this one. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to do two minutes, if that's okay. Does two minutes work, right? Because I know we're over. Yeah. Um, first of all, just decolonize this place as both a decolonial formation that includes over 50 groups in New York City. Simultaneously, it's facilitated by 10 people. That's one. Two, our understanding of what decolonization can look like is not purity, but it is from below and to the left. And it is, like the Zabatistas have said, walking we ask questions, which I think really kind of is in sync with what Lewis Gordon was talking about, just from a different kind of metaphor or, or lineage. The other thing that people need to understand is we made a determination in New York City, and this is a very strategic uh, thing, to say <clears throat> we're prioritizing collective liberation. We're making transnational solidarity, decolonial transnational solidarity, a strategic choice for us. We're also saying indigenous struggle and sovereignty, black liberation and free Palestine, that triangulation can upend empire and rearrange relations and desire. Um, <clears throat> in these kind of actions, what you don't see is a lot of the eating together, the working together, the partying together that isn't separate from, say, teaching or whatever is your day job. In that sense, we are committed. Um, we don't like words like optimism, pessimism, and hope. As a matter of fact, I think at one point we said, fuck hope. <laughs> but, but a lot of that is to unsettle where people are coming at the reality of their own condition. The other thing is that we recognize that we operate from a place of complicity because there is no outside. But from that complicity comes a notion of agency and responsibility, right? <clears throat> and I think that people are quick to point out oppression, quick to think about how it could be different, but not quick to do the work amongst each other. And that's really what's complicated, whether it's in a, 
uh, an intimate relationship, a sexual, re all of these kind of things, people are used to talking about politics but not used to embodying it. And somehow in the midst of the conflict, they choose to part ways. And what we've done in our formation is says, there are certain red lines. We don't work with NGOs. It's very important that we don't work with NGOs. That's a space that's already occupied, <laughs> right? The other thing that we do is that our, our, tra our, our organizing for us decenters identity as it tries to decenter wh whiteness. And then the challenge for each of us is how do we center and, 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 and retain the specificities of struggle in a very material way, not writing about it, right? How do you embody it in the organizing, in the room, and how it, the constellation is? And the recognition around accessibility uh, these modes of things, not as there, there are challenges, but they are not impediments to action. And so although you see th what I'll say about shutting down a bridge or, or organizing mass evasion, or right now going head to head with the police is that we spent ye 10 years building both an analysis and a capacity. You show me an NGO that can put 3,000 people on the street, then tell me an NGO that's committed to your liberation. It doesn't exist. For us in New York, we know it doesn't. So, so these are some of the things that we're embodying. But when we, in 2010, and this is the final point I'll make, people look at what happened in the United States, and they thought Occupy Wall Street wasn't a revolution or an uprising or whatever. And many of us were engaged in the thing before it was named that. But what happened was an erasure of the people of color that were central to its formation and also internationally were involved in it, whether from Egypt or Greece at that time in 2011. Those were moments of rupture. Occupy Wall Street centered class analysis and economics. Then you see that actually in Bernie Sanders right now. So that's, that's fine. It still has a white problem because it doesn't decenter the structures that produce it. But that was our success and failure. We brought class to the forefront. Unfortunately, it didn't center racial justice. It didn't, um, it, it didn't deal with patriarchy and sexuality in our own spaces, in our own movements. So you could look at Black Lives Matter movement as centering kind of racial justice, but, and that was another moment of rupture, had the successes of failures, had to figure out how we can be in solidarity with that movement before Mars had joined us because we were in different formations at the time. But our recognition that our formation could not hold. Like part of what I'm just saying is like, we needed to create a new formation that doesn't speak about something else that we think is essential to how we move, right? And then <clears throat> from there we can talk about like, Me Too, all of these moments, moments of rupture for movement yet to come. And I think FTP, Fuck the Police, also stands for a lot of other things. But for the moment, that's what we're concentrating on. And it resonates in the world with what's going on. And I think that these moments of action, of stepping out of line, require taking a risk, as Shannon says, to take a stand. So, so some people, you know, we've been in organizing spaces where it's like, we need to organize the thing and we need to get the permit because the largest amount of people need to participate. Not for this, for other things. Because we need to create a crisis. And because we know what the police is and we know how harsh the police has been and how surveillance is in the United States. And one of the, one of the learning curves that happened with Occupy Wall Street and with Black Lives Matter is that there needs to be an elimination of respectability politics for a diversity of, act, a diversity of tactics and strategies for how we can move separately and together around decentering whiteness, around all these things. And that's, we're happy Just to have, the love. Stickers the and then uh, please take stickers we've distributed and we have a magazine right here that centers, um, th this brings the analysis that we're talking about, the thinking with Palestine. So thank you. Both uh, Decolonize This Place and uh, Dr. Louis uh, Gordon will uh, join us again later this afternoon. Oh, so we're done.
So, uh, for now. But uh, what we're going to do in the interest of time and uh, to uh, uh, and, uh, the audience is uh, we're going to take a break between mm. five to ten minutes, invite you to go upstairs, grab a sandwich, mm -hmm. grab something, come back to the room, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, show Manuel Correa's film uh, so that uh, uh, we can continue with the afternoon uh, uh, sessions uh, more or less as planned. As I said this morning, the, thing, the good thing about plans is that they never go according to plan. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're there. Uh, keep your questions, keep your comments uh, for Luis and uh, DTP, FTP, <laughs> since uh, they will be joining us uh, later on. I do want uh, to emphasize uh, what uh, we just heard about the resonances between FTP's action, jumping on the, uh, the you know the turnstiles uh, uh, in New York uh, City, just as uh, Chilean kids were doing so in Santiago Valparaíso, others uh, in Colombia, in Bogota, Cali, Medellín, and elsewhere, and to give you a sense of that resonance. Uh, is uh, uh, among other reasons why I would like to invite you back in uh, uh, 10 minutes or so to watch Manuel Correa's film. So let us take a break while we set uh, our film together and I'll see you back in 10. <laughs> 